Hey everyone, my name is P and welcome to a Pokemon Pearl Hardcore Nuzlocke using only Pokemon whose name starts with the letter G. Any Pokemon that doesn't start with a G is banned. So that means I can use Grottle, but not Turtwig or Torterra, or I can use Ghastly and Gengar, but not Haunter. My rule set is on screen, but it's basically a regular hardcore Nuzlocke rule set. I also like to be transparent, so I do use rare candies in almost all my runs. I save time and energy, but I lose EVs in the process, and I think that's a fair trade. I also use the Species Clause, meaning I can reroll duplicate encounters, but I can only use one of each individual evolution line. Okay, let's get right into it. We start the game and name ourselves P and our rival, Barry. He drags us to Lake Verity, and we get attacked by Starlies and choose our starter, who we can actually use for this run. Turtwig evolves into Grottle at level 16, so we'll be able to use Greg later, but not for the first gym. Our real first encounter is a Geodude from the Ravage Path, who I name Gary. He's our only encounter before we take on Rourke, so he'll have to do some heavy lifting. We grab the HM for Rock Smash and catch our second potential encounter, a Zubat from the Orber Gate, who I named Giovanni. Did I miss an N while spelling his name? Yes, I did. Do I care? Yes. Please ignore it. From there, it's time to take on Rourke and his Rock types. We lead Gary and he leads his own Geodude. What a copycat this guy. Gary gets access to super effective magnitude at level 15, which is why he's pushed up almost over the level cap. We do need to get through this Geodude first, and to do that, we must spam resisted rock throws at each other until someone goes down. So, that's what we do. And with our level advantage, we eventually take down Rourke's Imposter and level up to level 15. Now equipped with super effective magnitude, Cranidos comes out second. Alir lowers our defense, and Gary rolls a magnitude 5, which does a little over half damage. Rourke uses a potion, which doesn't quite get it to full, so a higher roll magnitude 7 KOs. Last up is Onyx. A Screech lowers our defense to minus 3 now, but a magnitude 8 leaves Onyx with a sliver of HP. On the next turn, a rock throw at minus 3 still does very little, as a magnitude finishes off Onyx and wins us our first gym battle of the run. Rourke gives us the Coal Badge and the TM for Stealth Rock. From here, we have a few things to take care of before the second gym. First, we get back to Jubilife and help Dawn take down these grunts that were introduced to as Team Plasma. After smacking those bozos down, we catch our third encounter, a Magikarp from Route 204, who I name Georgia. She'll join the team right before the second gym when she evolves into Gyarados at level 20, but for right now, to the box for you. We arrive in Floroma Town and start dealing with Team Plasma again. While we do that, Greg evolves into Grottle, making him eligible for the team. We also grab another potential encounter, a Shellos who I named Gemma with a G. Gemma with a G will evolve into Gastrodon at level 30, but until then, to the box she goes. Next, we take on Commander Mars at the Valley Windworks. Normally, this fight is actually really difficult at this point in the game, but with a Geodude, it actually becomes super easy. Since Zubat goes down to a rock throw in one shot, Perugly can't do anything but use resisted scratch or faint attack. I fast forwarded through the rest of it just to save you all some time, but if anyone is ever struggling with this fight in a Nuzlocke, try a Geodude. From there, we get to the Eterna Forest and team up with Cheryl. This game loves this feature of having an NPC play with you, and I don't know why. Just make the next game double battle like VGC, please. While working our way through the forest, Georgia evolves into Gyarados, and Giovanni evolves into Golbat. They both join the team, bringing our member count to four. We get to Eterna City and... Oh. Hi, Cynthia. Please don't hurt me. After we survive that sticky situation, it's time to take on Gardenia and her grass types. She leads Shirubi and I lead Giovanni. A single wing attack KOs the overrated fruit, and Turtwig comes out second. Another wing attack one shot it again in a moment of deja vu, and Gardenia's last Pokemon, Roserade, comes out. A third wing attack leaves Roserade with a sliver as it fires off a grass knot. After that impressive output, another wing attack KOs, winning us our second gym badge. Gardenia gives us the forest badge and the TM for grass knot. Now that we can use cut outside of battle, we head back to the old chateau and catch another encounter, a ghastly who I name Gladys. Gladys is unique because we can use her for now and when she evolves into her final form Gengar, but not the middle version, Haunter. Also, side note, I use the universal Pokemon randomizer to allow impossible evolutions. 
I can't trade anymore since, you know, the uh, Nintendo servers are down on my real Nintendo DS. So this uh, Nintendo eShop app lets me alter the evolutions. They're on screen right now. I'm skipping Jupiter for the same reason as Mars, plus we have an actual Gyarados, so she got rolled. We get to Mount Coronet and Cyrus talks to us for a bit. Okay, cool, bye, please leave. We get to Hard Home City and show off our insane reaction time to catch this Baneri who's running away. Fantina isn't home, so we have to head to Veilstone City after grabbing strength from these two definitely not ghost old ladies. Now that we're in Veilstone City, it's time to take on Maylene and her fighting types. She leads Metatite and I lead Giovanni. A single wing attack KOs and brings in her second Pokemon, a Machoke. A second wing attack does about three quarters as a retaliatory brick break does less than Orenberry recovery. Another wing attack KOs, bringing out Maylene's ace, Lucario. Wing attack connects again, doing a little less than half damage as a force palm does remarkably little damage. Lucario's bite does so little damage, I actually laughed out loud, but it does get a flinch. A force palm crits this time, so it does decent damage as a confuse ray connects. It pays off immediately as Lucario hits itself in confusion as a wing attack brings Lucario into the red. Maylene heals to full with a Hyper Potion, and a Wing Attack does slightly less than half again. Lucario goes for a Drain Punch this time. The recovery means that a Wing Attack brings Lucario to a quarter. Force Palm finally brings Giovanni below half, but it doesn't really matter, as a Wing Attack finally KOs Lucario, and wins us our third Gym Badge. Maylene gives us the Cobble Badge and the TM for Drain Punch. The fourth Gym Leader Crasher Wake has the same level cap as Maylene, so we head straight over to Pastoria City. Along the way, we grab the Fly HM and catch a Giraffe Rig from Route 214, who we name Grace. Grace is going to be super useful going forward with her amazing coverage moves. Gemma with a G also evolves into Gastrodon and joins the team. It's time to take on Wake and his water types now. He leads Gyarados and I lead Grace who gets intimidated. A shockwave doesn't knock it out surprisingly and a super effective bite does over half. Wake uses a super potion and another shockwave brings Gyarados to a sliver of HP. One more shockwave on the next turn takes out George's clone and brings in his second Pokemon, a Floatzel. This thing has Pursuit, so we can't really swap. I go for a Shockwave, but a super effective critical hit Pursuit knocks out Grace. I bring in Greg. A Pursuit crits again, but it only does around a third as a Razor Leaf does half. A Swift does significantly less damage on the next turn as a follow-up Razor Leaf takes down Grace's Murderer. Last up is Quagsire. Since this cute boy has a 4 times weakness to grass, a single razor leaf eviscerates it. That wins us our 4th gym battle. Crasher Wake gives us the Fen Badge and a TM for Brine. Now that we're halfway done the gym battles, we deal with Team Plasma again. We chase this grunt around until Cynthia gives us a secret potion. This gets rid of the Psyducks on Route 10 so we can make our way to Celestic Town. We visit Cynthia's grandmother there, respectfully of course, so she doesn't come after us any more than she already is. We come out of the cave and Cyrus is just waiting there. Hmm. We get away from Cyrus as fast as possible and stumble into Fantina's ghost type gym. She leads Driftblim and I lead Greg. Driftblim sets up a minimize, but Greg still connects with a leech seed for some passive damage and recovery. A second minimize doesn't do anything as Greg connects with a bite that leaves the curse balloon with a little less than a third HP. I'm expecting Fantina to heal here, so I try to set up a curse for free, but she just uses Ominous Wind instead for a small amount of damage. On the next turn, she actually does heal as Greg just sets up a second curse to boost his attack and defense. The AI is so weird in this game. Driftblim uses another Ominous Wind and connects for some small damage as a plus two bite connects for the KO. I do forget that Driftblim has Aftermath, so Greg loses a ton of HP here. Gengar comes out second. I stay in to set up another Leech Seed with Greg, but before I do that, a Poison Jab does half of my remaining HP and of course gets the 30% poison. I swap into Giovanni on a Confuse Ray from Gengar. Great. Now I swap into Gemma with a G on a Spite that fails. Gemma happens to have Hidden Power Ghost, so after taking a Light Poison Jab, a Hidden Power almost KOs. I'm expecting Fantina to heal here, so I swap into Giovanni safely with no confusion. A Poison Jab does light damage, and a super effective bite takes Gengar to the red. Giovanni does get confused again by another Confuse Ray, 
but it breaks through and connects with another bite that KOs. Last is Fantina's ace, Miss Magius. I swapped to Georgia, who takes over half from a Shadow Ball. A Confuse Ray connects, but luckily, Georgia hits through Confusion and a Bite does 3 quarters. Barrier Recovery from Miss Magius brings her back over half. I swap to Gemma to shake off the Confusion and Psybeam does a quarter. I'm expecting a Magical Leaf here, so I swap back to Georgia who's gonna take neutral damage, but she just uses a Shadow Ball, which now brings Georgia to 32 HP. Now, this is a random move since I think anything kills here. My calcs tell me that a Magical Leaf and a Psybeam only kill on one specific high roll each. But in Diamond and Pearl, if the AI sees one roll that will kill, they take that as a guarantee. So I decide to roll the dice. Miss Magius uses a Magical Leaf and Georgia survives with just 6 HP. A follow up bite KOs winning us our 5th gym battle and letting me breathe a huge sigh of relief. Fantina gives us the Relic Badge and the TM for Shadow Claw. Now that we can use Surf outside of battle, I go grab the TM for Thunderbolt and give it to Gladys, who also evolves into a Gengar and rejoins the team. We get to Candlelight City and stomp Barry into the ground in a battle on the bridge. Speaking of stomping someone into the ground in a battle, let's take on Byron and his Steel types. He leads Bronzor and I lead Gladys. A Shadow Ball does around two thirds and a Flash Cannon does almost nothing. A second Shadow Ball KOs, bringing in Byron's second Pokemon, Bastiodon. I swap into Gary, who takes a Flash Cannon for a ton of damage that I wasn't expecting. I swap into Gemma with a G, and Bastion uses Rest for some reason. Gotta love this AI. Gemma's Surf does around half, and she takes an Ancient Power for very, very little. A second Surf from Gemma KOs our second Restored Fossil of the Run, and brings in Byron's last Pokemon, Steelix. Since this guy is less bulky than Bastiodon, one Surf from Gemma knocks out Steelix, winning us our 6th gym battle. Byron gives us the Mind Badge and the TM for Flash Cannon. We head to the library and an earthquake prompts us to investigate Team Plasma's activity. We need to head to all three lakes to take on all the commanders. I'm gonna skip all of these fights since they're basically all the same and I have so much room in the level cap. But what I'm not gonna skip is our last encounter of the run a Gibble, who I name Gerald. Gerald is going to be a monster in the future, but probably not for this upcoming Ice Gym. In Snowpoint City, we take on Candace and her Ice types. She leads Snover, and I lead Gladys. I use Confuse Ray, which connects, but Snover still hits a Leer through the confusion. A Shadow Ball leaves Snover with a Sliver on the next turn, as it sets up an Ingrain, locking itself into the fight while getting some healing in the process. Candace heals to full with a Hyper Potion, as Gladys hits a Drain Punch for around half, plus some nice recovery. A Shadow Ball on the next turn KOs Snover, bringing in Candace's second Pokemon, a Sneasel. It outspeeds and uses Taunt, but since it's 4 times weak to fighting, it goes down to a single Drain Punch, bringing Gladys back to full HP. Third up is Metacham, who isn't even a nice type. Since it's part Psychic type though, a single super effective Shadow Ball KOs, leaving only Candace's Ace. Obama Snow. Shadow Ball does a little less than half. Obama Snow unfortunately connects with a 55% accurate Grass Whistle. We stay in for Gladys' first turn of sleep, and a Wood Hammer does a ton of damage. Now, we have a couple of options here, so I'm actually going to break them down really quick. We have a 25% chance to wake up after one turn of guaranteed sleep. My team right now consists of Georgia, Gary, Gavin, Gemma, and Giovanni. Gary, Gemma, and Gavin, who's a gold duck that I caught, but don't worry about that, are guaranteed to die to a wood hammer. Georgia and Giovanni could probably survive one, but they don't have another move that could take out the rest of Obama Snow's HP. So our choices are A, gamble on the turn of sleep to wake up, or B, hope Georgia can simply brute force it. Option A gives us the chance to not lose a team member. Option B is just me banking on a crit from Georgia essentially, which is only 6.25%. So of course, we choose option A. We press Shadow Ball, and Gladys wakes up and secures the KO. A little luck goes a long way, folks. Candace gives us the Icicle Badge and the TM for Avalanche. Before the 8th gym, we have to go through the Team Plasma storyline, which I am too lazy to edit actually in, but yeah. That's done now. We beat Cyrus and got the Master Ball and freed all the Lake Spirits and 
Great, but we're not done yet. It's time for one of my least favorite battles in all of Pokemon, the double battle against Mars and Jupiter at Spear Pillar. Barry is gonna be absolutely worthless in this fight, so it's basically a two on one with a Pokemon to take damage for me. Mars and Jupiter both lead Bronzor and Barry and I lead Gladys and Munchlax respectively. Since Gladys is the lead for Cyrus, I immediately swap into Georgia, who takes an extra sensory from Bronzor 1 and Bronzor 2, while Munchlax sets up a stockpile. What a helpful teammate. Georgia sets up a Dragon Dance on the next turn to hopefully set up a sweep while the Bronzors use an extra sentry on me for light damage and a Rock Slide for a little more damage. Oh yeah, and Munchlax use Stockpile, can't forget about that. An Aqua Tail connects into Jupiter's Bronzor for the KO as Munchlax finally does something useful and takes the extra sensory, finally. Golbat comes out second for Jupiter. A plus one Ice Fang KOs Golbat before it can even play the game, as Mars's Bronzor sets up a light screen, and Munchlax lowers its defense by two stages. Third up for Jupiter is Skunk Tank. An Aqua Tail connects, but just misses the KO, as a retaliatory Night Slash does pretty solid damage. Bronzor uses another extra sensory, and Munchlax uses Swallow to sponge damage for even longer. A second Aqua Tail into Skunk Tank KOs, making the rest of the fight a two on one. Or a one and a half on one. I'm gonna fast forward through the rest of it to save some time, because even with Barry being useless on the other side, it's still a 2v1. We play it pretty safe and slowly take down Mars's team. That's one spear pillar battle down and one to go. With no chance to breathe, we have to take on our stalker, Cyrus. He leads Honchcrow and I lead Gladys again. Fun fact, Honchcrow is actually slower than Murkrow for some reason, so we outspeed and KO the fanciest bird, the Thunderbolt. Second up is Weavile. I can survive one attack, so we stay in and an Ice Punch does big damage, but a critical hit Drain Punch KOs. Third up is Crobat. I stay in and take a super effective bite for pretty solid damage and knock out Giovanni's Evolve form with a Thunderbolt. Last up for our Stalker is Gyarados. One four times super effective Thunderbolt from Gladys cleanly knocks it out, giving Gladys her first sweep and a victory at Spear Pillar. After that stressful endeavor, the most sane thing to do is of course, go cheer someone else up and not take care of ourselves. Go to therapy people, it's totally okay. Faulkner is depressed and he needs us to be his therapy for hire. Why hello there, my name is Pete and I'm here as part of the Smiles at Sunny Shore program, here to make your shores as sunny as possible. Clearly, it worked, since he sprints back to his gym to take us on with his electric types. He leads Raichu and I lead Gerald, who's now a Garchomp. We outspeed and a single earthquake hits Raichu back into Pichu with an unnecessary critical hit. Second out is Octillery, who's not an electric type. I'm expecting an Octazooka here, so I swap into Gemma, but it uses Bullet Seed which hits three times, including a crit. After that jump scare, I swap into Greg for the next bullet seed, but now it uses an Octazooka for some reason. I don't, I don't even know. An Aurora Beam on the next turn does solid damage, and since Octazooka lowered my accuracy, of course I miss my Giga Drain. I switch to Gladys, who takes up bullet seed for four light hits. A Thunderbolt on the next turn takes out his RNG Octopus, and Luxray comes out third. I swap to Gerald to try to dodge an electric move, which actually works this time. Gerald outspeeds and an earthquake KOs Faulkner's ace, bringing out his last Pokemon, Ambipom. This thing is a special attacking Ambipom, which just confuses me so much. It's not an electric type, and they gave it Thunder Punch from a tutor in Platinum. Anyways, Gerald deals with it with an earthquake and a couple of Dragon Claws after a Hyper Potion. That gives us our eighth and final gym badge. Faulkner gives us the beacon badge and the TM for charge beam. Now that we have all eight gym badges, we can head for the elite four. We get waterfall from Johto's sixth gym leader, Jasmine, for, for some reason, and we head to victory road. Barry gets absolutely stomped at the level disadvantage he's at, so he's not included. We get our gym badges checked for counterfeits and head into the elite four. First up is Aaron and his bug types. He leads dust Docks and I lead Gerald. I set up a sandstorm for some evasion in case we get some misses, and Dustox sets up a light screen. It's time for a new segment that I like to call, How Broken Can It Be? Dustox, one shot. Drapion, who's not a bug type, one shot. Heracross, not a one shot, actually, but one Dragon Rust plus one Earthquake Chaos. Vespaquen, one shot. 
And finally, the powerhouse ace, Beautifly. Yeah, it's one shot. And with that, Gerald ruins Eren's upward career mobility, and we claim our first Elite Four victory. Second up is Bertha and her ground types. She leads Quagsire and I lead Greg. I set up a Leech Seed for passive recovery, and Quagsire uses Dig. Very cool. Of course, we miss a Crunch on the next turn and take Dig for a small amount of damage. Our Leaf Storm is blocked by Protect on the next turn, and this Quagsire is slowly making my hit list. A double protect fails, thankfully, and a leaf storm KOs while dropping our special attack by two stages. Second out is Sudowoodo, whose name is my favorite Pokemon pun of all time. We stay in to set up a leech seed, as the fake tree sets up a sandstorm. Next, we swap into Georgia, who tanks a hammer arm on the swap for very little damage. Sudowoodo seems to sense the writing on the wall, so it hits a last ditch sucker punch for a quarter before going down to a waterfall. Third up is Golem the Gary Imposter. This one is quick though, as a single waterfall knocks it out, bringing an end to its short reign of terror. Fourth up is Wishcash, and this is where our luck against Candice comes back to haunt us. I swap into Greg, who takes an Aqua Tail for light damage. We get outspeed on the next turn, and it connects with a Rock Slide, which flinches. Another Rock Slide connects, and it gets a crit. We set up a Leech Seed for recovery. Okay. A third rock slide connects and flinches again. Are you serious? I'm not a math wizard, but hitting a 90% accurate move three times has a 72.9% chance, and getting two flinches is a 9% chance, and getting a crit is a 6.25% chance, so all that together is a 0.41% chance. What? Anyways, I swap to Gerald now, who at least actually resists these magic rock slides. A Dragon Rush actually gets a flinch in return, and it does about three quarters. Another connects on the next turn and takes out this sorry Pokemon who got a soft reboot in Gen 9. Yeah, I'm saying it, Dodon's always a better wish cash. Fight me. Last up is Hapowdon. A Dragon Rush misses, and Hapowdon sets up a curse. On the next turn, a Dragon Rush misses again. <sighs> and an Earthquake at plus one does half damage. I swap into Georgia to dodge the Earthquake, which was correctly predicted. A waterfall does slightly less than half, but it does get a flinch. This is the weirdest battle I've ever played. A second waterfall leaves the hippo in the red as it sets up another curse. Finally, one last waterfall chaos a Powdon and ends this battle. Bertha, I hate you. I hate you so much. The third member of the Elite Four is Flint and his almost fire types. He leads Rapidash and I lead Georgia. It starts to charge a solar beam as we set up a dragon dance for an attack and speed boost. Now we outspeed, so a waterfall KOs Rapidash before it can even use the Solar Beam. Second up is Infernape. We outspeed the Sinnoh starter and cleanly knock it out with a single waterfall. Third up is Steelix, who's not a fire type. A waterfall actually doesn't one shot, and a super effective Rock Tomb does about a quarter. One more waterfall does knock it out, and Georgia is 3 for 3 in this battle. Fourth up is Driftblip, whose only fire move is Will O Wisp, like it's like they didn't even try. Georgia's sweet bid does come to an end unfortunately, as I swap into Gladys who gets hit hard by an ominous wind for two thirds. Gladys does outspeed on the next turn, and a shadow ball does take out the hot air balloon. Last up is Lopany. Now, this one's dumb, I don't understand. Like, okay, two fire types, great, awesome. Steel is like, forged in fire, I guess? Like, I'll give it that. And a hot air balloon uses fire to like, fly with hot air. But what is, what is Lopany doing here? It has nothing to do with fire. It's not a fire type. It doesn't use fire. It's not on fire. Okay. Anyways, this thing just spams charm forever. So I'm going to fast forward through me swapping in and out trying to dodge him. But eventually, Gary does take it out with a brick break. And that's three out of four Elite Four members down. The last Elite Four member is Lucian. He leads Ash's stepdad and I lead Gladys. We outspeed and a Shadow Ball one-shots Mr. Mime. Second up is Alakazam. It does outspeed us, but it goes for a resisted energy ball for some reason, and it does a little less than half. A retaliatory shadow ball knocks it out in one shot. Third up is Bronzong. I don't want to risk anything after staying in, so I swap into Greg, who tanks a gyro ball, no problem. I'm going to fast forward through this too, since we just stall with soft mega drain, the leech seed, and synthesis is. That's a hard word. But TLDR, Bronzong goes down and Greg stays healthy. Fourth up is Metacham. 
I swapped to Gerald, which worked perfectly since it was going for a resisted thunder punch instead of a super effective fire punch into Greg. This AI is so weird. An Earthquake brings it into the red and a Fire Punch does little damage. A Full Restore brings Metacham back up to full, but another Earthquake brings it right back to where we just were. One more Earthquake finally KOs, and that brings out the final Pokemon of the Elite Four, Girafferig. An Earthquake leaves the Palindrome Pony with what must be 1 HP, as a Psychic does less than a third. Instead of finishing it off like a normal person, I decided to set up a Sandstorm so the Chip can finish it off. Yeah, I'm salty after the Bertha fight, I need this. With Giraffe Rig down to the Sandstorm, that wins us the battle and wraps up the Elite Four. Only one challenge remains. My childhood nightmare is the only thing that stands in front of me and beating this run. She leads with Spiritomb and I lead with Georgia. This thing can't really hurt Georgia, so it's time for another round of how broken can it be. We set up three Dragon Dances and have about two thirds of our HP remaining. Spiritomb goes down to one shot with Waterfall. Second up is Gastrodon. An Ice Fang does two thirds, and a Stone Edge takes out half of our remaining HP, but a Citrus Berry keeps us healthy. A second Ice Fang KOs, and third up is Garchomp. A plus three, four times super effective Ice Fang takes out Cynthia's Ace in one shot. Fourth up is Lucario. A single Waterfall KOs Lucario, bringing out Milotic fifth. This is the last chance Cynthia has to stop our sweep. We use Waterfall and it does slightly over half, but we get a flinch. This Elite Four run is being dubbed the flinch run. Another Waterfall KOs on the next turn, bringing out Roserade last. A super effective plus three Ice Fang takes it down and we've claimed our final victory of this run. We are officially the champions of the Sinnoh region and have beaten our second letter lock. Thank you guys so much for tuning into the run. This challenge was so much fun. It was a little bit on the easier side for sure because I had access to Gyarados and Garchomp, but I'm still getting my feet kind of under me with this kind of challenge, so give me a break. If you liked this video, hit the like button so that I can fulfill my dream of doing a sponsor read. I promise it'll be great. Cause you know what is great? The spots, the next one is gonna be a very different level of difficulty. So get ready for that one coming out on Valentine's Day. Hopefully. That's your hint for the next one. That's all I'm giving you. Leave a comment if you came from TikTok. I just made a TikTok account at the time of writing this, and I got like a couple hundred views in my first video. So maybe you came from there. I don't know, but let me know. But one more time, thank you guys so much for watching. I've been Palm and Peas, or P for short, and I'll see you next time.